I was born uh, May 14, which was Mother's Day at the time. And uh, my mother's mother died the same day. My father's name is Angel, begins with an A. And my mother's name is Anna, begins with an A. Do I belong here? (laughs) I just belong. (laughs) And um, growing up in New York and Harlem, because we were so very poor, uh, my parents worked seven days a week, 365 days a year. So uh, very seldom did I see them. And by the time I was seven years old, I became a people pleaser, a caretaker, a workaholic, and I never had a childhood. I didn't know what Christmas was about. I didn't know, like Halloween, I would make my own costume, which was a sheet with two holes in it. <laughs> hey, it, I did it. It was okay. And... Um, <clears throat> And birthdays, I used to just invite little kids, make believe it was my birthday, and make a little cake and invite kids over to the little apartment so I would have a party. And because I didn't know what parties were like and, and what gifts, you know, uh, to receive them, I didn't know what it was like. And so I grew, grew up in that kind of an environment. And um, as I got older, I continued to take care of myself. I went to school. Mom and dad could not come to any of the functions. And then came my sister, and then I became the caretaker for my sister. Uh, There were many, many nights that we had nothing to eat, or I just would stand uh, or sit at the bottom of the step waiting for the landlord to just give me something to eat. Um, Many times we were very hungry. But anyway, by um, the age of 12, I had decided that I either wanted to become a nun, a doctor, or an artist. And of course, as you see, I became this nunny poo that I am today. (laughs) God, my higher power, knew what he was doing. It was all in his plans, not my plans. He was taking care of me from day one from day one. Growing up home at home, uh, my father was very abusive. He was also an alcoholic, as I know today, and my mother was the controller. Um, You know, there were times that um, we never saw mom and dad because they came home so late. There were times that um, because I had this need to be needed uh, many times I would steal money that would save, they would save, and one time I did, and um, my father came home, and he just physically abused me that I had welts all over my body, and uh, almost to the point of killing me, and, uh, and my mother just standing there and watching the whole thing, and never saying, well, stop, you've been a killer. And that's the physical part as well as the verbal abuse that went on in my dysfunctional, chaotic family. By the time I was 12 years old, as I told you, I decided to be those three things. And um, I came to our villa one time, and I visited a cousin of mine, and she was in community. And the general asked me, would you like to become a nun? And I said, yes. And I went back home. I wrote the letters. Uh, I did what I had to do. I asked my mother for money to buy a suitcase. And how much clothes can you buy for a nun when you wear black and white? (laughs) It's like very little. So I did that. And on December 27th, two days after Christmas, I was brought up to the mother house by my family. And so I entered religious life. And when I say to you that I said to my God, my higher power, you are mine, I am yours. Everything that I have, Father, is yours. I give myself totally to you. And I meant that at age 12. And so I grew up in religious life. I went to formation But what I brought with me into religious life was the people-pleasing, caretaking, 
workaholic, and I had tons of low self-esteem. Tons of it. If there's anything that could be smaller than an ant, that's what I am and was. And I brought all that into community life. And the only way that I thought that I could be just as good as all those other nuns and everybody could love me and like me was that if I really worked hard in the convents, I would clean, I would fix, and they would say, how nice, Bruni. Oh, wow, you do such nice work. And that made me feel good. And then they would love me because I did such nice work. So I became that people pleaser and caretaker and workaholic, and it continued on into my religious life. By the time I was 16, I received my habit, and still I am saying, God, I am all yours. Whatever it is that you want me to do, I will do your will. 18, I went out to teach. 18 years old, I went out to teach. And by the time I was in my perhaps uh, 30s, I went to New York and Harlem back to teach there, and I taught uh, the 8th grade. But I taught the 8th grade because I was always begging God, Lord, please make me, you know, as smart as the other nuns. There goes that low self-esteem. You know, if, I'm, if, if you let me teach the 8th grade, they'll know that I'm really smart. You know, and I was always praying those kind of prayers. I was a survivor because when I got that beating from my father, and I learned this skill then, I went back to school, and the sister asked me, well, how did you get all those, all those, you know, like welts on your body? And I said, well, my sister got me in trouble, and I got the beating. I learned the survivor skill then also. So now I'm teaching in New York and Harlem. And um, I befriend a friend, uh, an Irish woman, who was teaching in the school in the seventh grade. And one day she says to me, Bruni, you you can come over to uh, our house. We invite you over for dinner. And I said, okay. So it was a weekend. And I go over to her house and... She says to me, what would you like to drink? And I said to her, well, I don't know. So she said to me, would you like a scotch? I said, okay. How would you like it? I said, I really don't know. So she poured the scotch, and she put some cubes in it. And I went, and I said, oh, my God, this is awful. doesn't take long, does it? No, does not take long. And then she said to me, you want another one? I said, sure. (laughs) That's how it starts. And then we sat at the table. Because you're probably thinking, what kind of a drunkalog would a nun have? She's supposed to be holy. (laughs) Well, guess what? I became the drunk nun. So she gives me, we sit at the table, I have to have these few scotchies, you know, and I'm sitting at the table, and now she's giving me wine. And it wasn't, I've never tasted Blue Nun wine. Can you, <laughs> can you believe that? All my life drinking, I never tasted the Blue Nun wine. So then, you know, she gives me wine at the table, and you know I'm getting happy. And then we clean up, and then she gives me cordials. At the beginning of my drinking career, I began to keep it Catholic, my drinking. I drank Christian Brothers brandy. I didn't want to feel guilty. I didn't want to get in trouble. So I said, let me keep it safe. So Christian Brothers brandy, I said, this will be a Christian and it's a brother, I think I'm doing pretty good. Well, that didn't last too long. And so that night, 
I'll never, ever forget that night for as long as I live because I was the happiest nun in New York City. <laughs> and then I said, oh, okay, now I have to go home and I have to be on the Harlem River driveway. So I'm saying, you know, when I get home to the common, I hope those nuns are sleeping because I'm just too happy. <laughs> and I never forgot that. I never forgot it. Well, as it, as it went along, you know, um, I love going on weekends to her house now. <laughs> Not because it was a break for me, because I already had thing drinking in my brain. It didn't take long. And so now every weekend is nice whenever I can go out. And then uh, she would take me out. We would go out to eat in a restaurant. And, you know, we would order scotches, you know. Um, the only thing I couldn't handle very well uh, was martinis. What a tearjerker. You ever see a nun cry so much after she drinks a martini? It was me. It was me. So, you know, I just kind of pushed those to the side. <laughs> and we continued. And then, you know, it was all social. My second year. My second year. What a spiritual uh, a journey I've been on. My second year, I said, oh, this, this stuff is really good. You know, where has it been all my life? And the second year, I said, I've got to get me some for myself. The disease is cunning, baffling, powerful, and insidious, and it respects no one. No one. Doesn't care who you are. And so the second year comes along. And we're only getting $35 a month as a little budget money. So now I'm into, you know, how do I, dressed as a nun, go to a liquor store? <laughs> so now you know we don't go to Barnes & Nobles to read up on how to do it. So in my mind I say, well, I'm living in New York and the streets are huge, back and forth. And I said, I just got to get me some of this stuff. And so now I psyched my head, my brain, and my thinking is all different. And I said, well, okay. I go to the liquor store, dress as a nun, and I go in, and I say, sir, very, like, sheepish looking I was. Do you think you can give me a, a bottle, a, a half a pint of Christian Brothers brandy? And so, you know, they have those plexi windows, and you, it's like being in prison. And you hand the money to him, and he hands the bottle in a brown bag. A brown bag. Um, and I'm thinking already while he's hand, oh, they can't see me coming out of a liquor store with a brown bag and a bottle in it? No way. Now I'm in there, and the light bulb goes on. Sir, do you have any boxes that I can have? Because I'm thinking all of this in my head. If I come out of the liquor store with a box and the bottle inside the box, they'll say the nuns are moving. <laughs> the nuns are moving. Well, you know how many boxes I had in the convent? I can move the pope, the bishop, the priest, my mom and dad. I could have started my own company. And that's how I began to do it. And now I can't go to the same liquor store, you know that, because now they get to know you. And in our own mind we're saying, they must think we're drunks. So now I decide to travel around. You know, and I do traveling around so that nobody knows. But for that whole year, I kept, you know, Christian Brothers Brandy. And then I graduated because, see, you, I ran out of money. So now I'm drinking the, the chapel wine. <laughs> and now, because I'm drinking the chapel wine, this is all very spiritual, you know. <laughs> because I had a lot of spiritual moments while I was drinking. Trust me, I did. And now I'm drinking the chapel wine, but it's getting to be kind of low in the bottle. So, you know, God performed this wonderful miracle. 
His mother asked him, son, you need to, you know, turn the water into wine. And she says, mother, I'm not ready. And then here I am. My miracle was I changed wine to water, gin to water, Christian brothers to water. That was my miracle. And so now everything in the chapel is changed to light wine. (laughs) Very light. You can almost use it as diet wine. (laughs) And that priest that came, he just kept going. (laughs) And I just kept... Very spiritual. (laughs) Very spiritual. And as I continue now, the year I'm getting, you know, now I I need bigger, better things than Christian brothers. I need to have my own bottle of wine. I need to, if I can afford, a bottle of scotch. You know, that was, ooh, that was the limit. Oh, beyond the stars I was. And, um... And I began to drink. I never drank in the morning. I never drank in the afternoon. And I never drank uh, while I was teaching ever, ever. And eventually that changed also. Everything changes and never, ever stays the same. Because the disease is cunning, baffling, powerful, and insidious. And so I began to drink in the morning a little bit. And then, you know, in the evening and then weekends, I drank a lot. I drank a lot. And so my, cha- my, my drinking changed and, um, you know, it became bigger bottles and better. And um, at this point, my father was drinking a lot also. He was being very abusive to my mother. And my mother would call me and say, I don't know, your father's drinking a lot. And I would say, Mom, you know, he works hard. He deserves it. And then one day I went to visit, and Mom was not around. And I went to visit Dad, and I saw Dad go behind the couch and take out a bottle of Puerto Rican rum behind the couch. And he opened it, and he drank it, and I stood there watching him, and I said, Oh, my Lord, that looks like me. That's just like me. And so, you know, uh, he put it back down, and then he gave me money, and he said, go out and buy me some liquor. And I said, okay, Dad, because I was getting for myself also. (laughs) So that was a good deal. So, and I remember doing that, and I never forgot that. So I continued my drinking. Uh, I had a small accident while I was in uh, New York. I was uh, stopped by the policeman on the Harlem River Drive because I was like the flying nun. (laughs) You know, early in the morning or afternoon, I've had a couple of scotches, you know, a couple almost to empty the bottle. And then I always drove with a half a pint underneath my seat, the driver's seat, just in case, you know, emergency. (laughs) And the cop stops me. And, Lord, you know you learn to bargain. How does it all come? And you learn to bargain. You say, God, please, please get me out of this one, and I promise I'll stop drinking. Oh, please, Lord. And the cop stops me, and he says, Sister, where are you going? (laughs) And I said, oh, was I speeding? And now he continues, let me tell you, this is very spiritual on my part. He continues to tell me all about when he went to Catholic school and the nuns hit him. (laughs) And now I am praying, dear God, please let him stop. Please, Lord, let him stop. I promise I won't drink. I don't want to hear this cop and his story. This is all in my brain. You know, and then he's finished, and then now he says to me, Sister, 
just be very careful, okay? And I said to him, oh, thank you, officer. God bless you. (laughs) And with that, remember that promise that I made? Well, here was me. I needed a drink after he, what he did to me. I needed that drink. I needed a quart. And with that, I continued and I continued drinking, you know. Um, I got changed from New York and I went into, um, I went to uh, Newark to teach. And um, at this point now, my progression begins to get worse. And I know that there is something wrong, but I have all this shame and guilt that I don't know who to tell it to. I can't tell it to my community because I know, you know, they wouldn't understand or what would they do to me. My best friend didn't know what was happening to me, but I knew something was wrong. You see, there were many mornings when um, I began to drink in the morning that I would wake up or or drank during the night, and I would wake up, and I would put my hat on this way. (laughs) And I said, I look good. I look good. I look really good. There were many mornings... There were many mornings after drinking round the clock that I would get up and I would put my bra on in the back and say, God, you gave me four? When did this happen? When did this happen? Because at this point, I'm not dressing myself well, as you can see. I'm not dressing myself well. I was at a point that I was drinking so much that my eyes were bulging out. My chin was like hanging really low. I looked like a bullfrog and four months pregnant by nobody. I tried to squish into a girdle. Didn't make it. Because, you know, you're in total denial. Now you're hiding everything including your stomach, your eyeballs, everything. (laughs) Everything. And people are saying, Bruni, do you have an allergy? (laughs) And I remember now that when I came into the rooms, I heard about allergies. Well, I was saying, yeah, yeah, I have this allergy. I don't know what it is. (laughs) And I continued drinking. And now in Newark, I'm drinking morning afternoon and nighttime. I was also going to every liquor store that I possibly could go to. But I want to tell you that there were many, many nights that I was on my knees praying to God, to my higher power, to please take this away. I cried and I begged him And I said, why? Why did you do this to me? I loved you so much. I give myself totally to you. Why? And then in that heavy heartedness and in my brokenness, in my pain, I would go around and think, where did I hide that bottle? Because I can't, I have to kill this pain. Where did I hide that bottle? And then I would just drink because that was the only thing at that point that would take my pain away. The only thing I had left. And I continued. I continued for years to drink that way. I wasn't very spiritual under the influence of my disease. I was not. I lied. I stole a check from my mother and forged a signature on it. And she called me. She says, how could you do that? And in my head, I said, I deserve that because you never told me you loved me. And it is only until four years ago that I heard those words. I deserve that check. 
I made up all sorts of stories. I borrowed money. I was slowly, it's like a zombie, slowly killing myself. Dying to self, as we all have experienced. Yes, my life was unmanageable. It became unmanageable. Seven days a week, 365 days a year, I needed to drink. And then at night, I would just beg God, please take it away. Please take it away. And then one day, on January 6th, after begging him for so many times. And by the way, you probably say, well, sister, how did, how did you hide all those bottles that you had? Well, you see, as a teacher, I had the eighth grade, and I decided one day to have a school project, (laughs) an art project. You really get a lot of enlightenment, (laughs) spiritual enlightenment, because, I mean, you drink, but then you get these beautiful thoughts. (laughs) And one was that I got all these bottles and I, saw, I told the kids, you know, you bring the masking tape and the brown shoe polish. I've got the bottles. <laughs> and they were big bottles. They were wine water bottles. They were ones that were curly. There were all kinds of bottles. And I had them hidden in the closet. And that day we had an art project. I gave everybody a bottle. <laughs> and then they took the masking tape and they just break it in. Put it on the bottle, all pieces, so that it looks really antique. And then they put shoe polish on it. And then they buffed it up. And then they brought it home as a gift to their mother. I was nice in my drinking. I did share. I did a lot of sharing. And now, the disease has brought me, my drinking has brought me to a place of when I'm driving and drunk that I pee in the car. How humbling is that? And then thinking that after I do all that in the cushion and, you know, stop and get out and and instead of saying, Bruni, there's something wrong with you. Now, my thinking is, oh, I'll throw this cushion out, buy another one, wipe it all up, and I wear black. Nobody will know I did it. <laughs> it's our, our thinking. And by this time, I'm at a point where I've hit my bottom. I can't stop drinking. God's not helping me right now. You know, I wake up with tremors. I can't remember who I spoke to. I drive intoxicated. And on January 6th, my provincial comes, and I had begged God that night, January 5th, and I said, God, please, I can't take this anymore. I can't do this anymore. Please help me. And she came that morning, and she sat at the table, and she said, I'll see you first, Bruni. And I said, okay. And she said to me, Bruni, you have a problem, and we have a place for you. And I said, it was like a volcano erupting. And I said to her, no, no, I don't want to go. And I cried, and I cried. I said, no, no, I'll stop. I was admitting then that I had a problem. I didn't know it. I said, I'll stop. And I cried and I I put my head down and I cried. And then I said, I'll leave community. I'll just leave. And she said, no. We're going to get you the help first. And then if you want to leave afterwards, you may still do so. And with that, I put my head up. And I just said to her, I put my hand down and I said, just take me. Just take me. And with that, 
uh, she said to me, uh, she asked me if I was ready. And I said, I'm ready. I'm ready. And we got in the car, and she brought me to uh, rehab in Morristown, CAI, Clinic for Addictive Illnesses. And I stay there for uh, 30 days, five in detox, which is a really terrible detoxing that I had, and the rest working a program. And I learned a lot in rehab, but the important thing is that I had to come back to community where nobody understood the disease of alcoholism. See, they thought that, well, I'm a Latina, Latinos all drink. You know, it's like, just like that. Or that this, you know, uh, can look straight at the problem. A problem that had a solution to it. And with that, I came out of rehab. And I must tell you that in rehab, I learned uh, that, you know, you can drink vanilla extract. (laughs) That they drank rubbing alcohol. Yeah, you go, oh, that's how I went, too. Oh, how could they do that? And, you know, uh, that they did all these. Oh, man, the mind is insidious, cunning, baffling, and powerful. And it wanted me dead. And I come out of rehab and, like, maybe two weeks into being sober. I said, what, what are they talking about, vanilla extract? Left to my own devices, I am self will run riot. I'm better than the flying nun. And I go down the cellar of the convent, and I see these little bottles of vanilla extract. And I say, let me just see what they're talking about. Well, lemon was, nah, not lemon. Mm-mm. Banana, I don't think so. Now, let me try vanilla extract, and I'm looking... Well, it's like maybe 5% alcohol and the rest is in my head for baking. I said, let me check this out. I unscrewed the little bottle, and I go, and I got a buzz. Now I am really running wild, because just like liquor, now I am going to Foo Town, Wallbounds, ShopRite. I'm buying little bottles just like on the plane of vanilla extract. Of vanilla extract. And I got sick of the small ones, and now I'm buying the big ones. And on a hot summer day, going to Seton Hall to study for family counseling, I have just finished a bottle of vanilla extract. And on my way, walking on a hot summer day, walking in the heat, I am walking and I go, (laughs) and they're stopping looking, this poor nun, she must be sick. (laughs) And I go again, (laughs) well, it was like brown Niagara Falls. (laughs) And at that point in the middle... In the middle, I stopped, and I said, God, please take this away from me. In the middle of the street, I said, Lord, please take it away from me. And I continued to walk to Seton Hall. When I got back, I got on my knees in my privacy of my room. I got on my knees, and I prayed. I said, Lord, I don't want this in my life. And then I said, Father, please let someone share at a meeting that they had a slip. That night I went to a meeting because I was ashamed and I had all this guilt. Please, Lord. That night I went to a meeting and a woman raised a hand and she said she had a slip. And I raised my hand and I said, my name is Bruni and I am an alcoholic and I drank vanilla extract. It is in our honesty, in admitting the truth about who we are and what we have done, that we get to find the center of our own lives 
and the God who loves us. Humility is truth, and truth is I am an alcoholic. And with that, I continued every day, every day, going to meetings. I went to meetings in a red Camaro (laughs) because that's the only way I could get there. I went in a red Camaro. Bus driver probably said, what's happening to these nuns? (laughs) I've been in... I've been to meetings. It took me an hour to get to a meeting, an hour to stay at the meeting, and, an hour, and another hour to get back home, back home and in between just to talk to some AA. And I went every day. I went to a meeting when the car was just going, chuk, 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 and just about getting there. I went to meeting in snow, sleet, rain, because that's how I went to the liquor store. Snow, sleet, rain, hail, nothing stopped me. So I changed it around, and nothing was going to stop me from getting well. And every day I went to a meeting, and then they said to me, you need to get a sponsor. Well, in community life, you don't share anything. I mean, as far as, you know, uh, secrets or anything like that, what's going on in your life, you can't have too many friends, all right? Uh, So I learned. I learned in AA by coming to the meetings. The first thing they said to me, Bruni, we're going to love you until you can learn to love yourself. What a powerful statement. My mother never told me she loved me. I never heard those words from my mother. And four years ago, because being in sobriety, you know, the promises all come true. You keep waiting. They all come true. And they all come true different times and different places. And they're not all the same, but they're all promises. And every day I called my mother and said, Ma, I love you, I love you, I love you, Mom. For years And then one day, four years ago, I called my mother and I said, Ma, I love you, I love you. And she started to talk again and I kept saying, Ma, I love you, Ma, I love you. And for the first time I heard the words, there was silence, and I heard the words from her, I love you too. The first time. And I'm not a young chick. (laughs) I cried my eyeballs out. I cried. Like a little baby. And I ran up the steps to my friend in the convent. I said, guess what? My mother told me she loves me. And I was crying. And then all of a sudden I stopped and I said, I wonder why she said that. (laughs) Typical alcoholic. (laughs) Typical alcoholic. And to this day, she does say to me, I love you. I'll take it in any way, she says it. I love you. And so I kept going to meetings. You know, I sat in the rooms. I was a crying nun for a year. (laughs) For a whole year. I got my sponsor. I got a few of them, my first and my second. My second sponsor, who is a convert, and I am her godmother. And I kept going to those meetings a day at a time, a day at a time. And a day at a time, I have a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of my spiritual condition. And my spiritual experience has been about a personality change. I almost lost my faith, and you brought it back for me. Thank you. You brought it back for me. I sat in those rooms, and you shared your experience, your strength, and your hope and courage. And I said, where have I been? And you gave me that. You helped me to become the person that I am today. You were my eyes when I couldn't see. And I didn't want to see anything. I was so filled with shame and guilt. 
I didn't want to see anything. How could I be here like this? I'm a nun. You're supposed to be respecting me. I'm not supposed to be drinking. What am I doing in these rooms? All the supposed to be's. All the why God. Why did you do this to me? And I sat in your midst. And you gave me the courage a day at a time to move on. You gave me my faith back. That's a number one. You heard everything that I needed to hear because I didn't want to hear nothing. I didn't want to hear what you had to say because I just wanted to be out there. You were my voice when I couldn't speak. Because you know what? I just didn't have the words to say. I didn't know what to say. And then I became the person that I am today because you loved me. Was in community. My spiritual experience today, my spiritual awakening, and my relationship with the God of my understanding has been given to me from the fellowship, my AA family, and the gift of sobriety. That's where it's come from. Today it is a gift for me. I've become that person that God wanted me to be. It was his plan. He knew that I was suffering in one way. Because you see, suffering for all of us, it's a good thing. Because in that suffering, we're able to share with one another. We've been there. We've done that. Come, sit next to me. Let me, let me just give you a hug. Let me wipe your tears. My community is not saying that to me. If I felt like drinking today, do you think I'd run up to a nun? I don't think so. (laughs) Sorry, but I don't think so. First people I would call is my sponsor and my AA family. And I love my community today. You know what? Today they respect me for who I am. Just recently they called me to do a commitment for their community. A drunk nun? His work, not mine, not mine. Standing here in front of you, how humbling this is. How humbling. Because I had never had anything to offer. And today I do. I have much to offer. And one day at a time, I go to meetings you know, I read my 24-hour, I call my sponsor. Just this morning, I called her. Are you sleeping? Is it too early? I'm sorry I woke you up, but anyway, I need to speak to you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's what sponsors are for. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, um, it is an awesome gift. I'm living the life that, you know, I am, I, today, I am living the life that wants to live in me. Yeah, I'm living that life. What I am today is God's gift to me. And what I make of it, of myself, is my gift to him today. And just one day at a time, right? That's who we all are. We are gifts to each other. You are a gift to me, I am a gift to you, and we are gifts to each other. And I'm going to tell you and end with, I'm not in control anymore of anything in life, as you know. You know, because we don't. We don't control anything. And who would want to control anyway? You know, there's no fun in controlling. Because they do what they want to do anyway, so. You have been gifted, and I have been gifted with the gift of sobriety a day at a time. You are awesome women on an awesome journey. Women to women, yes. Women to women, yes. That's what you are today. Women to women. 
You and I have value and dignity in our lives today. We have that. Don't allow anyone to take that away from you. No one. You work hard to be where you're at today. Very hard. And you owe it to yourselves as beautiful women, as women that your higher power, the God of your understanding has created. And you hold on to that. Remember that he loves you very much. And at times, and I'll share this with you, there are many times in our lives that even though we're sober, we're going to fall to the ground and we're going to break into a thousand pieces. Now what time, not one time, does the God of your understanding say, I'm done with you. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, I'm going to Mary's house because, I don't know, you can't seem to get it. (laughs) He doesn't say that. He never says that. In your own brokenness, in our sinfulness, from day to day, when we fall, or we, we go three steps ahead and two back, it's okay. What he does for you when you are there and you're broken into a thousand pieces, he says, come, come as you are. And he puts you back together again, piece by piece. And then he says to you and me, go and start again because I love you. Go and start again. Because I love you. And that is every single day. God loves you. The God of your understanding loves you. And I love you too. Thank you for loving me just the way that I am. God bless you.